delighted, absolutely delighted to welcome Terry Irwin, who is the head of the School of Design at Carnegie Mellon. And her research on transition design, which is a new area of design, study, practice and research, argues for social transition towards a more sustainable future. Terry's been a practicing designer for more than 40 years and is one of the founding partners of MetaDesign, an international design firm with offices in Berlin, London and San Francisco. And from 1992 to 2002, she did her time with the actual Fortune 500 um, clients, such as Nike, Apple Computer, Hewitt Packard, Barclays Bank. And to have this background where, where she's worked with Meta Design on projects in the area of computer software, interface design, brand identity systems, exhibition, wayfinding and information design, is really important to you guys because to translate these discourses is tough. So can I have a round of applause for Terry? Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about transition design and I was asked if I could sort of situate transition design relative to perhaps a couple of other areas of design focus you're probably familiar with. So some of you don't remember a time when service design didn't exist, but I do. <laughs> so it actually started as a conversation about the need for a new area of design focus. I think we can situate design for service here on the left side of the spectrum. Usually, it is applied within existing socio-economic paradigms, often for industry, where I would say design for service is now established. If it was a souffle, it would be big. <laughs> design for social innovation is still emerging. And the really exciting thing about that is it is starting to challenge our dominant socio-economic political paradigms. And I think many of us in the room would argue that those paradigms are actually at the root of many of the wicked problems confronting us in the 21st century. So it's really great that there's an area of design focus that's starting to push on those and look for alternatives, particularly in the area of economics, like how instead of for-profit can we begin leveraging unused social resources, for instance. Transition design is situated on the far end. And we say that it argues in terms of completely reconceiving our socio-economic political paradigms. And that, of course, will take a long time to happen. Those, tra those paradigms will transition slowly. But we felt a few years ago that there was a conversation missing among design educators and design practitioners. And that was the kind of design that requires us to play very closely with people from other disciplines and other fields. And it is design geared for the long, slow process of systems level change and societal transition. Transition design, we like to say, brings together two global needs. And the first is the idea that entire societies must transition toward more sustainable futures. And the second is the realization that these transitions will require intentional systems level change. Now, you can see evidence of these memes in the number of transition related projects and initiatives that are creeping up all over the planet. And the recent rise in what I will call deep systems thinking and the proliferation of knowledge, tools, and processes that are all aimed at understanding complex systems and systems problems. Now, it's really important to acknowledge that our societies are always in a constant state of transition. But these transitions are usually unintentional, full of drift, and the ramifications are only understood in hindsight. We call it history. The question before us, I think, in the 21st century, is whether we can intentionally direct these transitions toward more sustainable futures. So transition design is essentially concerned with two types of systems, socio-technical systems and wicked problems, which are really systems problems. Socio-technical systems can be thought of as tangles of societal infrastructure, people, and all manner of designed artifacts, processes, 
and scripted interactions. And all of these, of course, are embedded within the natural environment. This list of wicked problems is long, and it will get longer. And both socio-technical systems and wicked problems exhibit characteristics of living systems. They exist at multiple levels of scale. They are interconnected and interdependent. They're self-organizing. They display emergent properties. And their dynamics are governed by feedback loops. Therefore, changes in one area of a system ramify throughout in unpredictable ways. Now, these systems are everywhere. And their ubiquity is perhaps best explained by this old joke. Two fish bump into each other. And the one says, how's the water? And the other replies, what water? Now, Marshall McLuhan, in his very famous book, War and Peace in the Global Village, said, the one thing fish know absolutely nothing about is water, since they have no anti-environment which would enable them to perceive the element that they live in. So my argument is systems are so ubiquitous and our interactions with them are so pervasive, we really don't see them, and therefore we don't understand them very well. But these unnoticed systems, and here's the kicker, produce their own patterns of behavior over time, and they become entrenched and intractable and they are actually, therefore, unintentionally directing our societal transitions toward unsustainable futures. Transition design aspires to develop an approach to shift the trajectory of these systems through strategically placed designed interventions over short, mid, and long horizons of time. So transition design, in a way, resembles Chinese acupuncture in its approach. Acupuncturists look for points of intervention that have the greatest potential to transition the system back into balance and health. However, where those needles are placed can seem wildly counterintuitive, but it's actually based on a deep understanding of a body system's dynamics. Transition design proposes a similar approach to seed and catalyze the transition of our socio-technical systems towards sustainability, just as we transition our bodies to health. A group of scientists, engineers, and researchers in Northern Europe have actually been mapping the anatomy of socio-technical systems, essentially providing a roadmap for initiating transitions. We think that the approach also needs to integrate social practices, human behavior, and worldview into the approach, but it is nonetheless a very useful framework for thinking about how to transition complex social systems. So the Sustainability Transitions Network has identified three key systems levels, the landscape, the regime, and the niche. And they argue that systems transitions are always a combination of both large and small events, technological innovations and breakthroughs, and changes, and this is where we may not always think about this, changes in beliefs, social norms, and practices in everyday life. It's all of them together. That's the only way to transition a complex system. This diagram shows how the events, innovations, and changes at the different systems levels sparked the historical transition from horse-drawn carriage to the automobile. Now here I've highlighted just one of the shifts or what they call destabilizations that contributed to this transition that changed the way humans live on the planet. The invention of electricity at the landscape level opened up the possibility at the niche level for an unchallenged experiment like the electric tram. The tram's success changed the entire infrastructure at the regime level in the form of paved streets as transport arteries. That change, that sweeping change at the regime level, led to the phenomenon of suburbanization 
at the landscape level, which has changed the way generations of people on this planet live their lives. So the researchers hypothesized that if we can better understand how these historic transitions happened in the past, then we should be able to intentionally seed and catalyze transitions toward more positive futures. Transition design aspires to develop tools and knowledge sets for doing just that. So strategically placed small and large design interventions have the potential to shift an entire complex socio-technical system over time. As an example, take a community's need to transition toward water security. <clears throat> transition designers might read that large socio-technical landscape to understand what led to a water <coughs> shortage in the first place. Then identify leverage points where strategically placed design interventions that can see and catalyze change can be situated. But here's the kicker. We can see and catalyze these shifts in the system, but what do we want the system to transition to? Now, this is the point at which it becomes clear that a new approach is needed that integrates a rigorous and creative process for thinking about long-term futures. And humans don't do that very well. And yet even a cursory search on Google or Pinterest reveals a staggering array of futuring and foresighting tools and methodologies that have sprung up in recent years. Now there seems to be a clear intersection between foresight studies and design. Transition design sits at the intersection of foresighting and systems design with an emphasis on resolving and leveraging stakeholder relations. Now, visioning and backcasting are two important aspects of transition design that are based upon one simple premise. If we don't have a clear vision of where we want to go, we won't stand a chance of getting there. The co-creation of visions of desirable futures enables stakeholders with conflicting agendas to begin to transcend their differences in the present and enter into a space where they can focus on their common values, hopes, and desires about the future. Political activist and author Stephen Duncombe has said, visions can inspire us to imagine that things could be radically different than they are today, and then actually believe we can progress toward that imaginary world. These long-term visions also act as a magnet or attractor, to use the language of complexity theory, drawing us toward that desired future, as well as a compass that guides the creation of projects and initiatives in the present Fred Polak, who is considered to be one of the founding fathers of future studies, has said, when the dominant images of a culture are anticipatory, they lead social development and provide a direction for social change. And Stuart Brand, in his book, The Clock of the Long Now, asks, how do we make long-term thinking automatic and common instead of difficult and rare? Transition design proposes that one of the roots of wicked problems is actually our inability to think in long horizons of time. So we fail to consider the consequences of our actions and the things we design. Western societies most often think in terms of fiscal quarters, fashion seasons, or perhaps annual projections, but rarely longer. Resolving wicked problems will require design for the long haul. It took dozens of years and decades for problems to get wicked, and it will take that long for them to be resolved. So this is simply thinking about the horizons of time, our, our habitual way of thinking, which is three days, that's long for most of us, and we certainly do not think in terms of these long horizons of time. And one of the things they talk about in the clock of the long now is they're actually building a clock in the desert of the southwest in the U.S. They're just going to tick 
and run for 10,000 years and humanity is going to have to keep it going as an object lesson in how to train ourselves to think in longer horizons of time. So the cone of the future is a foresighting approach that refutes the idea that the future is inevitable, fixed, and static. Rather, it is a broad spectrum of possibilities that can be explored in rigorous ways and preferable futures can be defined and articulated at high levels of fidelity. And here is how we're putting some of these ideas together. So the emerging transition design approach calls for deep stakeholder involvement and proposes three context setting steps. Step one helps stakeholders achieve a shared understanding of the problem, resolve their conflictual relations, and leverage areas in which they agree. Step two enables stakeholders to co-create compelling visions of long-term desirable futures toward which they want to transition. It also establishes radically large spatio-temporal context for both the problem and the vision. And step three involves backcasting from that desired future to the present in order to create a transition pathway along which ecologies of interventions can be situated. So projects become steps toward that desired future. And it looks like something like this. Ecologies of interventions at multiple levels of scale, implemented over multiple time horizons, all connected to each other and that long-term vision. So these ecologies act as steps on the transition pathway. Now these ecologies are comprised of both new and existing projects of all kinds. And this is where social innovation in particular connects to the approach, at the level of designing these specific design interventions. The problem that transition design attempts to address is the one-off nature and relatively short timeline associated with many projects due to the tight problem frames that have been imposed. And that is often, and I know this from having been a practicing designer for so many years, usually we are constrained by these tight, tight problem frames and short deadlines. And you cannot solve for social and environmental concerns when that's imposed upon you. So in many traditional approaches, Practitioners and researchers find or are given a problem that is clearly defined within a relatively small context. In other words, it's a manageable problem that we've probably solved before. And this is what Horst Rattel would have called a team problem. If we frame all problems within these tight, tidy frames, we can solve the problem every time with the approaches we already have. We do this in the posture of the expert that says, I've done this before, I know what to do, get out of my way and let me do it. If, however, we include social and environmental concerns in the problem frame and we consider all of the stakeholders affected by the problem, things change very quickly and we realize that the problem we think we see is a symptom of something much bigger. And it starts to feel something like this. The more you trace the roots of a wicked problem up systems levels, the more intimidating it gets. <laughs> now when and if you're finally able to see the entire problem, it's overwhelming. If you persist and you consider the context of the problem, which is the larger socio-technical ecological system within which it's situated, things get really gnarly. And that's about the time you hear people say, as Horst Rattel did, that problem is simply unsolvable. Or I can't put a dent in that. Or anything I do would be like a drop in the ocean. This is the scale at which it becomes clear that no single individual no single discipline or single profession can solve a wicked problem or transition an entire system. 
The sheer magnitude of the problem and its context demands transdisciplinarity, radical collaboration, tenacity, and patience. And we think a new process for solving problems and seeing systems level change. Transition design works with stakeholders to develop a long-term vision of a future in which the problem has already been resolved. Then it undertakes a process of auditing existing one-off solutions within both the problem frame and the context to determine which ones have the potential to be connected to each other via that long-term vision. Some projects will already be in natural alignment with each other, while others may need slight adjustments to become part of that ecology of interventions we're talking about. This approach also reveals potential points of interventions where new projects and initiatives can be situated to catalyze and ignite exponential change. And here is where the acupuncture metaphor really comes in again. The challenge is how to methodically and productively explore large socio-technical contexts and the wicked problems contained within them. So we've been working with this thing that we're calling the spatio-temporal matrix, within which problem and the future vision are situated. So it's essentially a sketch for conducting research and a template for articulating future visions. We ask research questions unique to each area of the matrix, and we think of it as looking up and down in space and backwards and forwards in time. So we situate both the problem and the vision at the mid-systems level in order to look at how both large and small events contribute to the problem and can inform a different kind of future. So we look to the past because the origins of complex problems always lie there. It took those problems a really long time to get wicked, and we have to find out where their origins were. We look at how people in the past were living and what the social norms were before the problem arose. In the present, we look for contributing factors at all levels of scale and their ramifications for society as well as our everyday life. But in the future, stakeholders further articulate their vision and ask, how might social norms and beliefs have changed if the problem had been resolved? What technologies might or might not exist? How would everyday life and lifestyles have changed for the better? Exploring this radically large context informs the design of those ecologies of interventions that will exist at multiple levels of scale and that will be implemented over short, mid, and long horizons of time. So as an example, consider the problem of break-ins and muggings in Gideon's in my neighborhood. And that's a fact. To address the problem, we might increase the number of police on the beat, start a block watch and an email group that makes sure everybody has burglar alarms in their houses and pepper spray in their backpacks. But that's really not getting at the roots of the problem. We can see that these break-ins and muggings are connected to the bigger wicked problem of crime at the city level. And at the city level, crime is related to many other countless wicked problems, such as drug addiction, gang violence, a lack of affordable housing, a rising divorce rate, racial, racial profiling, unemployment, gentrification, and an influx, believe it or not, of high-tech businesses and employees to Pittsburgh. And that's to name only a few. But the roots of these problems have connections at the national level as well that involve really big problems such as bank bailouts, federal penal codes, Supreme Court rulings, the housing market collapse, the opioid epidemic, the high cost of education, lack of prison vocational programs, widespread unemployment, to name a few. So depending upon how you look at it, this can be overwhelming or it can become an opportunity to look for leverage points in the bigger system 
and develop interventions designed to address as many problems simultaneously as possible. So a transition design solution would involve an ecology of interventions at multiple levels of scale, as we've said. And it might include something like a national policy that mandates vocational training in federal prisons. But it also might include and be connected to a citywide initiative aimed at drug rehabilitation. And at a neighborhood level, a mentoring program for at-risk youth. All of these interventions and many more would be considered acupuncture needles aimed at resolving the wicked problem of crime and transitioning the entire system over time towards something that all of the stakeholders have determined. So, we developed this transition design framework as a way to bring together the transdisciplinary knowledge that we thought would be necessary to seed and catalyze systems level change, and we didn't think it was going to be found mostly from within the design disciplines. It consists of four mutually influencing and co-evolving areas of knowledge and skill sets. So we need visions of where we want to go. We need better theories of change that better explain how change in complex systems can be seeded and catalyzed. And we argue, and I think this is one of the most important things, we argue that new mindsets and postures are required for doing this kind of work. Postures of radical collaboration, generosity, a more ecological worldview, and you probably need to check your ego at the door. And we say that new ways of designing will ar arise out of all of the previous three areas. So each area of the framework is comprised of a palette of transdisciplinary practices that can be configured in situation and, and place-specific ways. So some of the practices are useful in framing complex problems, helping to identify and resolve conflictual stakeholder relations, and facilitate the creation of long-term lifestyle-based visions of sustainable futures. Other sets of practices are relevant in designing tangible, sustainable interventions that can actually begin to destabilize these entrenched systems and begin to nudge their trajectories in towards more sustainable futures. And we're experimenting with applying these practices in a three-phase approach. I'm emphasizing experiment. So we reframe the present and future in that large spatio-temporal context so that a shared understanding of the problem is achieved and stakeholder relations are resolved through the co-creation of the long-term desired, co-desired futures. These visions inform the creation of design interventions, which are tangible projects and initiatives in the present and short term. And these will resemble the ways in which we're already working. Some of these interventions might involve service design solutions or social innovation solutions. The difference is that instead of projects and initiatives being one-off solutions, they're taking the form of these ecologies of interventions that are connected via mid- and long-term visions that act as steps along the transition pathway. Now the third phase will be most difficult, doing nothing. Because we cannot predict how a complex system will respond to an intervention, we must wait, like the acupuncturist, to see what its response will be. This will be in conflict with our dominant socioeconomic paradigms that call for quick, decisive actions that render quick, profitable results. This phase is undertaken in postures of speculation and patient observation. And it will also require compelling narratives about why sometimes doing nothing is actually crucial. So we've been working with the city of Ojai, California since January of 2017 
to introduce transition design as a possible framework to help them transition toward water security. They have one source of water, they've got three years of water left, and the entire city is going to have to be abandoned if they don't figure out what to do. So some of the issues that have to be addressed include multiple stakeholder groups who don't like, agree, or trust one another. A general, believe it or not, lack of awareness and understanding of the problem. A lack of a shared vision of where they want to go. Absolute lack of understanding of the uneven power dynamics in that social system. An inability to think creatively in long horizons of time. And a lingering hope that there is some silver bullet or single solution that is going to solve this problem immediately. They don't know where to begin. There's actually a lot of grief um, that they have facing the loss of a lifestyle that is going to forever change. And there's overall a lack of funding for any kind of project that they can imagine. So we've run two workshops with stakeholders not to solve the problem, but to introduce the approach. And it looks something like this. The workshops are messy and boisterous, but they're also amazingly full of a bit of fun and laughter. By introducing the dynamics of play and gaming into the process of looking for conflict between each other, stakeholders have developed relationships with people they previously viewed as opponents or just downright lunatics. They became advocates for the process, but also they became representatives of the diversity of perspectives about the problem itself that proliferates. Now, this project took a very dramatic turn last December. I don't know how many of you might have been watching the news about the fires in Southern California and the subsequent floods and landslides in the neighboring town of Montecito. When the fire broke out, we were actually in Sydney, Australia, and we went to bed expecting to wake up the next morning and see that Ojai had literally burned to the ground. That's how bad it looked. Everyone we knew, everybody we were working with had to vacate the city. And we couldn't come back for more than a week because of the particulate matter that was um, in the air from the fire. This is, a, this is a fire map. So all of those colored areas represent the timeline of the fire. And what you're seeing there is an absolute miracle. Against all odds, the city of Ojai survived with only a loss of about 100 homes. It burned for six weeks. It consumed 440 square miles. Over 100,000 people were evacuated. It consumed 440 square oh miles. 8,500 firefighters were mobilized, and over 1,000 structures were lost at a cost of over $120 million. Even more alarmingly, the Santa Ana winds that drove that fire were the strongest and the longest of duration anybody had ever seen. And at its height, the fire generated its own weather. So now this is climate change. And these people know it's climate change. But even more surprising, there was a shocking loss of life associated with this disaster because of the, the, flood, the rains, the floods, and the mudslides. The neighboring town of Montecito is one of the most affluent cities in all of the United States. And 22 people died because they refused to evacuate. So the privilege did not do a thing. This was the great leveler. And what it made us realize afterwards is that we were not involved in a project to transition Ojai to water security. We're actually involved in a project to transition the community toward climate resilience. And that is connected to many wicked problems and is far more complex. So we were in Ojai last month to discuss the next phase of the work. And we developed just a one-page overview that the city council could use to explain the process we are proposing to engage with them in. And the city council just last week voted unanimously to sign a memorandum of understanding with Carnegie Mellon so that we are actually able to go out and fundraise 
for those ecologies of interventions that I've been talking about. And while we're trying to identify funders, we've identified a scope of work that we'll be undertaking this summer on an absolute shoestring just to keep momentum alive and to continue to build consensus, not so much even for transition design, I don't care what it's called, but to get people on board with the idea that long-term systems level change is gonna require a change in behaviors, a change in mindset, a change in their lifestyles, and they're going to have to be patient, and they're going to have to look at it like running a marathon as opposed to a sprint. And that is going to take some work. What we've been learning on the OHI engagement, we've been taking into the classroom. And we've been teaching transition design at the undergraduate, masters, and doctoral levels. And this May, we just uh, graduated our first three doctors of transition design. So students at the undergrad level are introduced to concepts like wicked problems, conflicting stakeholder relations, and visioning and foresighting approaches. And then Gideon and I teach a master's and doctoral seminar in transition design, and we really work with these students much more like colleagues, so they're actively engaged with us in testing new tools and practices, and they've actually been extrapolating on them our last semester, we couldn't believe how engaged they were. And the important thing to say is, this is a website that we put up last fall in hopes that other educators who are interested in integrating transition design, um, there's reading lists, there's videos, there's um, all kinds of um, props and materials for teaching it that you can download. So that, that's the place to go if you're interested. So to finish, we think that transition designers will take up a diversity of roles that require new knowledge and skill sets. And it's important to say that not all transition designers will come from, transition, from design backgrounds. They're going to come from all walks of life. And some of them will be acupuncturists. You know, they will be looking for places to intervene in the system, and they'll be identifying the fights we're fighting the ones that can change the logic of a debate or the trajectory of the transition, the ones that can change mindsets, and they'll be developing new narratives. The questioner will support the deliberation on fundamental questions that create new discourses and prompt cultural shifts. The questioner facilitates dialogues around the big questions with large consequences and make sure that citizens from diverse social groups all take part in these conversations. The gardener, on the other hand, sees systems transition by identifying, connecting, supporting, and spotlighting early pioneers of the new system by watering the seeds of new ideas and enabling change through emergence. Emergence happens when separate local efforts are connected to form communities of practice and suddenly systems level change can emerge. The connector creates connections and learning cycles between systems levels and geographic locations. Complex social systems are actually comprised of members of civil society and industry that form clusters of informal networks, movements, and grassroots organizations. And each of them has their own norms and belief systems. <coughs> Connecting these clusters to enable information and learning exchange is a huge leverage point for change. And finally, the maker. That's what most of us in this room probably are. This is the role we designers are familiar with. Socio-technical systems are permeated by designed artifacts, built structures, communications, and scripted interactions and behaviors. The maker brings a deep understanding of materiality and human needs to the creation of these designed touch points within the complex system. The maker ensures that all of these are desirable, viable, feasible, and sustainable. So finally, a global conversation about the need for systems level change and designers' role in that seems to be emerging. 
and a network of both educators and practitioners is joining us. So, so far, we've got about 11 partner universities who are either integrating transition design into projects, coursework, curricula, or research strands. And we have, I think right now, it's increased, we have about six professional design firms who are really wanting to work with us to figure out how to develop the tools further. And that map in the background was just a snapshot from my academia.edu page a couple of months ago, and the areas of blue show where the transition design materials have been downloaded and, and looked at. So one of the things that we're hoping to do in the coming year is develop some sort of platform that will help connect and unite the people interested in continuing this conversation with us so we can have knowledge exchange, maybe we can exchange students and faculty, because as I said before, no single institution, no single discipline or group of people are going to be able to constitute this, and in particular, it's going to take a diversity of geographical and cultural perspectives to begin to understand what this area needs. So that's it. Thank you. I graduated here a few years ago. And my kind of dissertation and final project was very future-based. And I found in my research one of the things that was really difficult when speaking to others of future. In the context of what you're doing, do you put a time frame on it? And what is that time frame? And what would be your ideal kind of future? All of the questions that you just posed are the things we need to be working on. So towards that end, the best thing I thought I could do is hire Stuart Candy to join our faculty to help us answer questions like that because futuring and foresighting is not my area of expertise. One of the things we are very interested in though is what we sometimes call indigenous wisdom because I think at one time we probably knew how to think in terms of 100 years and now we don't because the whole idea of the seventh generation that was suggested by the Iroquois nation asked itself what are the implications of the things we're doing now that will affect us seven generations out? And I wonder a lot if that didn't have something to do with a stronger connection to nature and the cycles of a planet, which are inherently longer, and we've become so disconnected from that. So I think there's so many ways to go at this. So when we continue our work with OHI, for example, I think it's going to be really important for the stakeholders themselves to try and envision long-term futures. Now, one of the books that we've given to many of the people in Ojai is Jonathan Port's The World We Made. Have, have you seen that book? So, Forum for the Future, here in London, founded by Jonathan Port, long-time environmentalist, activist, wrote a book about two years ago called The World We Made. And it's a hypothetical book written by a fellow named Alex McKay from the year 2050, who is reflecting back on how the world transitioned to sustainability. And because he's been working in the area of sustainability all these years, he was able to somehow work in all of the facts and understanding about the push-pull between policy and grassroots activism and all of these things. And he talks about, well, the water wars of, you know, 2035 taught us that blah, 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 blah. So it's actually a very rigorous look at what you might encounter as you transition. But the really other very important thing is it's written from the basis of a lifestyle perspective. So the other thing, so I, I, I'm Rather than focusing on time spans, I'm kind of telling you the other things we do feel more sure about with respect to future. We feel that the context of place-based lifestyles that are very much embedded in the local ecosystem, but that are cosmopolitan in their networked exchange 
of information and knowledge globally, cosmo what, what Ezio Manzini calls cosmopolitan localism, mm -hmm. is probably a powerful context from within which to imagine a future. I don't know what the right time frames are because I actually agree with you. Our ability to do that has atrophy. Although we did find when we were running futuring exercises with the folks in Ojai, it was amazing how easily, easily they were able to agree on what Ojai might feel like if they, there was enough water. They could, they could agree on how they wanted to live there. And yet they can't even all agree that there's a water shortage. Some of them just think, well, there's too many damn tourists coming to town. If all the tourists were in here, we wouldn't have problems. And the farmers think, well, they're building too many new houses. I'd have all the water I need for my orange groves if we didn't let them come anymore. So even though they can't agree on what the problem is, if you say, what would your life be like if there was enough water? It's amazing how they take to that. So my hope is that if we give somebody like Stuart Candy the space to do research within that territory, and we continue to work with our master's students, those are the kinds of questions we can begin to answer. But ironically, I don't think we can answer them until we land a few transition design projects and find folks like in Ojai that we've been very transparent with. It's like, we're trying this approach out because we believe this, this, and this, and this. And two years ago, they would never have done it. It's amazing what trauma will do to people. Because that loss of life in Montecito made everybody realize we've got to do something big differently. And it's also very powerful, as everybody in this room knows, if you're not coming from a for-profit background like I used to, in which I'm trying to make a profit as well as solve your problem. All of a sudden, I can say, no, Carnegie Mellon is going to invest some seed money into this, and we're going to help you fundraise. And the only thing we require is to be able to write about what we're doing, about what works and doesn't work, so we can hopefully educate a new generation of students to work on problems like this. And so that kind of narrative has really gotten the community on board. And I must say, it's a very uh, progressive, diverse community. I mean, it's a good place to start. It's bounded. You've got old hippies. You've got, you know, Ted Danson and Mary Steen Virgin over there. Lee Chenard is in it. So, but you also have people living in trailers below poverty. So, I think that framing transition design problems may take a couple of years. We've started working with a woman named Cheryl Dahl. And she founded a company called Future of Fish. It's a nonprofit. And for 10 years, she's actually been doing transition design. She's the only person I think I've ever seen who's been doing it. And they have actually impacted the problem of global overfishing systematically around the planet. So I'm very, very excited about sort of merging what she knows with what we know. And it's also convinced me that academic researchers aren't going to crack this problem on their own. We need people who are actually out there in the field full time that are working with us, hence my interest in creating a network that's not just within academia, that extends into the practice, but it's got to be all walks of practice. Um, the transition pathway, does that offer us a way of actually saying that, yes, we are making progress, you know, these things are happening, there is a long-term goal, a plan, mm -hmm. um, and we have these things to point to which are steps in the right direction. Cameron has always been very, very worried about this idea of vision becoming, falling into the mid-20th century elitist trap of these utopian visions that were specified by an elite group uh, and that were not um, democratic, egalitarian, and they were fixed. So if I had more time, we would actually, I would actually go into another diagram in which visioning is represented more as an ongoing way of being. So you, and I have a slide that actually says, okay, uh, we're on Earth, 
And the mission to the moon was constantly off, off course. And they were constantly course correcting. And they course corrected because they kept their eye on where they wanted to go. But as you progress down that transition pathway, your perspective changes. And the projects and initiatives that you've implemented yield learnings and insights that may change where you want to go. So I have a slide in which you move along the transition pathway and all of a sudden, behind the moon, you see Saturn. And you think, oh, I want to go to Saturn instead. And I would only know that I want to go to Saturn because we learn from the work we've already done and we are fluid enough in mind and body to be willing to let go of that vision and constantly be grounding it. So I'm really interested next week to see what Cameron has to say about this because he's been thinking about it more. But I'm beginning to think it would be very easy for us in our object oriented language to get overly fixed on the vision instead of developing the practice of visioning as a way to collaborate and a way to design. But I think the key is doing it together and making sure all of the stakeholders affected are represented and you can't do that in workshops. You'll never reach all the stakeholders in workshops. Because the workshops we run at Ojai are on a five-star resort. And you're not going to get an illegal farm worker showing up at the resort so their voice can be heard. So through, I think, an array of field research techniques, we're going to have to go out there and make sure that the human stakeholders are represented. But the other thing we've been working with is there's an Australian environmentalist called John Seed. Has anybody heard of him? He developed along with Joanna Macy, okay, this is going to sound a little strange, but go with me. He, he developed this technique called the Council of All Beings. And in it, in a circle, somebody must speak for the, for the water. Somebody must speak for the mammals. Somebody must speak for the amphibians. So in Ojai, who's going to speak for Lake Casillas? Who's going to speak for the keystone species that's actually being taken down by the drought? You have to make sure that all of the strands in the web of life are somehow represented in that vision. Does a transition designer always have to be based at a kind of super meta systemic level <laughs> to be able to play a role in, in kind of carrying a vision forward, or otherwise are they only sort of subject to being past the vision that somebody else has developed. Yeah. There's a there's a kind of a, yeah. an awkwardness yeah. in, in the sort of who owns the vision. And I understand that the idea is that oh it's for everybody, but who is kind of maybe my question is who is the everybody that the designer yeah. is serving? No, I, all of these are excellent questions that we must delve into. From where I am today, I would say that the important thing is that we take up postures of service. And I think most of us, for most of our, our careers, or certainly me, I've been the expert. You know, I ran an international design firm. And I got rewarded for showing up and sounding really certain. And I sound certain right now, and I hate that I do. I'm just trying to hold a room, but this is all experimental. And so, one of the things we're asking, we're talking to OHI about, is in the fundraising, can we create lines, I don't know what you call um, salary positions here, but we call them lines. Can you create a line for a community member or members to hold the continuity for the project and not the external consultant? Because I think that's the only way that you're going to maintain the continuity over time. We're going to come and go. I don't live in Ohio. You know, I can bring a certain kind of neutrality, but how do we enable them to hold the vision? How do we enable them, and, and we are of service to the community, to keep that alive and find the right people to do that work? Because if we can't figure that out, we're going to recreate this model where, this is a bad metaphor and I don't want to offend anybody in the room, but how many of you have been to a doctor 
this sort of says to you, just, I'll ask you the questions and you tell me what's wrong. And there's all these other things you need to tell them about your health, and they don't want to hear that, because they're the expert. And I feel like as designers, we sometimes do that, because we don't have the time, we can't touch everybody we need to touch. And so I think there's work to be done addressing that very question, and I suspect that the onus is going to have to be with the community to carry it. But what often happens in social innovation projects is the community donates their time, and we show up and we do all this great work for a minute, and then we leave, and the community's like, okay, what do we do now? And so as we're beginning fundraising right now, we're trying to talk to funders about funding lines for the community, and then we are the ones so we'll probably have to lead the process and have those difficult conversations about emotional intelligence and the ability to play nice with others. And I've done that a little bit in the workshops. Um, but that too, there's all these territories that have to be explored and documented. And I think if we can get a network of people all interested in this, we can all be working on these various facets and feeding the knowledge in. Because every single question you're identifying, all I can do is say, yes, we have to figure that out. Yes, absolutely. It relates to the, to the answer that you just gave. Um, I was just thinking, isn't the biggest design challenge that we have related to redesigning governments? Because um, it's necessarily short-termist and now becoming increasingly isolationist what, what with Trump and Brexit. So, um, and these wicked problems of sustainability are beyond one nation, they're beyond one community and as you rightly say, if they keep being lost, these insights and these threats, um, yeah. it's about redesigning systems of government first, no? <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with part of what you say, but maybe not all of it. Um, I would put government at that regime or landscape level and say, boy, is that a point of intervention that needs to happen at the meta level. But I don't think there's a first and a second or a sequence. I think we have to be intervening everywhere as we can because the low-hanging fruit is not going to be with the government in my country. Um, I think we're seeing things like more women have run for office in the United States in this past election than ever before. And the women are actually winning some of the races. Okay, so there's a systems change there. Now, how does that relate to redesigning the government? I think that that's probably a leverage point for redesigning the government. I'm sure every person in this room is abundantly aware that our children can't go to school anymore without being worried they're going to be massacred in classrooms. There's not a day I, I go to work that I don't worry that I'm going to be shot. So all of a sudden you have a huge uprising of young people in America who have said, that's enough. And these people are right on the cusp of being able to vote. So I think part of what we all need to do if this work resonates, is learn to be students of systems. To look at that newspaper every day and say, what's happening that is a clue? So if that's your passion, and there's plenty of room to work, so each of us will resonate with some area of that system that needs to change. And you can see the hard things years have changed. Like in my country, I don't know what it is here, I only know I got into this country by the hair of my chin. chin, chin. They nearly sent me back the other day. So the same thing that's happening in the US is sort of happening here. So how do we begin to see the signs? And the grassroots signs are oftentimes going to be the low-hanging fruit. And you know, Gideon has, <laughs> poor man, been living in the US now for nine years. And I don't think you truly understand the power or the vastness. You don't understand the size of the US or the power that the states have until you live there. So he, he's often saying, you know, in the United States, probably the big cities or even states may be the way to change government. I mean, California might secede. Who knows? You know, or, or, but 
for us that care about this, we need to become better and better at reading the systems. And that's what I want a new generation of design students to be able to do. Because by the time you're my age, you're going to see things that I won't ever see. You will develop abilities that I can't ever develop. Because you will have been students of systems and, and social change for all these years. And so I kind of hate the word politics. I'm just, God, I hate politics my whole life. But I now realize I got to get involved. But it's, I think of it more in terms of social change about measuring the success of the transition design as it's a long-sighted process mm -hmm. and the problems are, uh, which are wicked are also intangible and in the future which is again intangible mm -hmm. and then uh, so for example there are concerns of gender issues at workplace and from my perspective it's uh, something to do with behavior which is intangible mm. and uh, then you also talked about how visions can change once you get into the process. Yeah. So uh, how to go about measuring the success? Part of the problem, I think, with our westernized reductionist culture is we have inherited a system that thinks you can only tell if something's working or not if it's quantifiable. We're not very good at measuring quality. Sorry. And yet, how do you measure if somebody loves you? I mean, there's all kinds of qualitative things that, that aren't exactly measurable. So I think part of the work is beginning to measure qualities, and I have begun to suspect for the last decade, that may have something to do with health. You know, if you study ecosystems, and I did an amazing master's degree in something called holistic science at uh, Schumacher College many years ago that Gideon ran. And one of the things we did was we studied living systems and we, dis we learned that an ecosystem is healthy in relation to the degree of diversity and resilience that is present in it. And if you look at species of animals, um, bright plumage or shiny coats are a measure of health. So I suspect there's work to be done in measuring health, how do you measure social health? What are, the, what are the metrics that are related to social health? And I don't think they're probably going to have much to do with money. You know, they're going to have to do with the bonds of community and probably things like redundancy being built into the system. And I feel terrible that I'm popping out on every single question you are asking me. But you're all very rightly identifying areas that need to be dug into if we want to change systems. How do you measure the success of transitions? Well, part of it is asking stakeholders how they're doing. And does tra traditional design approaches are more oriented, I would argue, toward users than stakeholders. You know, and all the time I've, you know, done service design, not so much social innovation, but we're very fixated on the user or human-centered design. And I'm even going to argue part of the problem is human-centered design, darn it. You know, why, why wouldn't it be life-centered design? We are one strand in a web of life. And if the other strands go down, we're going to go down. So it comes back to, I think, what you just said, which is the whole mindset and values. So how are we going to develop values and ethics and metrics for ascertaining if a transition has been successful? But my sense is it's probably going to be a lot of common sense. We've sort of taught common sense right out of ourselves, or we teach it out of children once they get into school. They kind of know. And I, that's one of the reasons we put such an emphasis on place-based lifestyle. Can you say a bit more, and I think it resonates with some of this, this sort of questioning around what is this great, this big future vision, whose vision is it, and so on. But I know, because um, I've, I've heard, heard you speak about it previously, <clears throat> there's a relationship between this future vision and the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. So there already is yeah. some infrastructure out there in yep. the world that is at this very macro scale yes. that is starting to define some areas that might actually provide, uh, well, yes. 
it's been a conversation that's going on for decades, yeah. represented by every country or m many countries yeah. in the world yes. towards what this sort of future sustainability might look like. Yeah. So transition toward that at the city scale, as you talk about in the meso scale, yes. that does give us something tangible to start working with. And I wonder if you could yeah. speak about how that sort of fits together. And, and, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Does everybody know uh, what Adam's talking about with the Green Deal? Jumpstart. The thing that I would like to emphasize is all of those are categories that we should absolutely be looking at as we develop visions of place-based lifestyles. But the way in which each of those will be addressed will be unique to geography and culture. And I think that is the work that goes hand in hand with understanding them because the UN can only put those out at a meta level. It's a one-size-fits-all. Here's everything we should all be thinking about. But I think we have lost our ability to make things place-based. Because almost all of the infrastructure that we interact with, or the companies, or the way in which our needs are met, it's a one-size-fits-all. You see the same stores on the same high street everywhere you go, right? We are all interacting with centralized, large, multinational firms all the time. So I think what goes hand in hand with those is saying, how does sustainable transport or energy differ in Dubai than in Pittsburgh, than in Devon? And how can an understanding of that ecosystem and that cultural history and the way in which people were living before it became a problem inform place-based, culturally, and honor the local culture. Like how can we recapture diversity as we work with these uniform um, categories. I think what you're talking about, or what I'm hearing, is the difference between goals and visions. There is a difference between a goal and a vision. A goal is, yeah. you know, this would be nice if we yeah. can concentrate on cleaning the water, yeah. having a quality, gender quality, and so on. Yeah. But the vision of what that looks like is always going to be contextual. Yes. So mm -hmm. there's the goal. There's the goal. Yes. What's the vision in the place with the people? And all the other yeah, <laughs> contextual factors that, that, yes. that you're in and that you're able to operate within. See, that, you said so it so much better than I did. That's it. It's all about context. And I realized I didn't address the gender thing, which is the bane of my existence every single day. Um, but the way in which that gets addressed in Pittsburgh is going to be different than the way that that gets addressed in Bahrain or Japan. Um, so how can we work with these sustainable development goals and make sure that context is always very firmly attached to them? Because I've just become such a believer in recapturing diversity. And I think in one of the biggest phenomenons we're all witnessing on the planet right now is the biggest forced migration maybe in human history. And as climate change gets worse, it's only going to increase. So reflecting on questions of what does it mean when two cultures come together? And how can we leverage that diversity towards something really positive? instead of it being divisive, I think is just such a great transition design problem waiting for somebody to latch onto. And it, and it raises fascinating questions. But there's a lot to be learned from history in that as well. So yeah, so this to me is such a good example of why a network needs to be constituted. Because when you think about all the knowledge every single person has in this room, 
that could be brought to bear on this issue of transition and systems level change, we could get so much further so much quicker. Because I've, I've gained things just in the short time I've been with you. And I'm going to go back and think about it. And I think when designers are the experts, we don't need it as much. You know, I think when we're talking about these complex problems and we have to play with other people, the issue is different. And, and I so believe in design, and I so believe that many of the tools and approaches that we as makers of the artificial world command, we can bring tools and approaches to these teams, but we won't be doing it as experts. And we, in turn, will be learning from them. So how, how do we find financial models to be able to do that is, is, is another, another big question. This notion of being the transition designer is the designer's actually got to learn to step back and actually got to learn to be really good listeners. And in terms of the way education curriculum is set up, the idea is actually you've got to have a big voice and design is about being heard. But in fact, my experience and I work with Dr. Dad in the way, yeah. it's actually just almost, it's, it's learning to be silent and to understand the different perspectives. But those are quite difficult. Again, they're intangible. Those sort of, and people, you know, a lot of people come into design because it gives you the opportunity to express yourself. It's about the ego. It's about, you know, um, so it, it doesn't necessarily fit with the idea of silence and observation. Yeah. So I think we're getting better at training that. But it's also this idea of working with different disciplines. So could you share your experiences in terms of how you are, I suppose, yeah. putting that into the curriculum and how do you engage students? Yeah. One of the things we often say to our students is all kinds of um, designers are needed in system culture. We're still going to need chairs. We're still going to need somebody to think very deeply about what that fabric is made of. And, and we're going to want that fabric to be as sustainable as possible. And people are going to under, have to understand you know, the engineering structure and the load bearing capacity and materials. And we're always going to have that. And when you're doing that, I think you can be an expert. You can be a little proud of the knowledge you've amassed when you're you know, just like, OK, I'm kind of tweaking the letter spacing up there and I feel really confident that it's more or less okay. But as you move up the levels, I think it's about developing the ability to toggle between being an expert, because everybody needs, I think, to still master an area of expertise. That's why you're all here. I'm a graphic designer. I'm an information designer. And I, and I use it all the time. I use it in all those slides you were looking at. And so, I changed my posture from that expert to what you're talking about, which is absolutely so essential, which is being of service and listening and facilitating other kind of work. So what I've been saying to my students is, you need to be more conscious of the posture you're assuming. And we're in this matrix you are working. Because in this matrix, in the lower left, is kind of a single designer making a single thing. And in the upper right, it's a designer as one of many people trying to work on a really complex problem, and it takes different skill sets. Did that add an answer? Yeah. Yes, it does. I, I mean, I think we, we, we will emphasize this reflective learning, but um, I think, and depending on what level you're coming in to the university, um, but I'm finding, increasingly, I'm working with such diverse people, which makes it fantastic, but on the other hand, um, you also have to take a, a very, very different role, and it's also learning to observe the dynamic between the different experts, which can often be overlooked. Absolutely. I mean, the, I think the, the tiny little step we've taken is we have um, two people that come in and talk about collaboration. And they talk about it from um, a body 
like an embodied point of view, and they make the students do all of these things in the beginning of the semester. And then by the end of the semester, it's actually been quite transformative for them. And they intentionally let students in from all of the diverse disciplines, so the designers don't think like, well, I'm fine. Um, and that has been a really important piece. But the problem is, I, I'm sure you guys wrestle with the same issue in curricula. How, if, if, you, if you use a metaphor of the T-shaped curriculum, where the crossbar is the breadth of knowledge and the vertical stroke is the depth of expertise, most of our students come in wanting to master something. It takes a really long time to learn to make things. Whatever it is, it takes a long time. And so every class that I create that is outside that making realm, that is outside, that is scaffolding expertise and not teaching expertise, it's a whole big discussion. And I worry about it myself. I don't want to see a world in which designers can't make things. I still make things and I really like it. I think the real leverage point for change is at the primary school level. I don't know what you call it here. It's well, that's, you know, we shouldn't be having to do all of this at the university level. You know, collaboration, radical collaboration, learning the dance between taking a lead and stepping back. You know, even when we did the master's degree in holistic science at Schumacher College, they, they made us learn the tango. They brought a tango teacher in. And they made all this tango because it's the kind of dance where leadership and followership is being handed off very subtly. And you can't tell at any given time what the signal was. But you know that you're going to lead and then all of a sudden you're going to follow. And that's such a good metaphor for the kind of work that we're talking about. But I should be having to spend university time teaching my students that. And yet this is the world we're in. So this too is a transition. And how do we begin to trickle some of these fundamental emotional intelligence and people skills actually down to the level so, so children don't forget them, so they don't unlearn them? I really enjoy what the show does. I really like the methods. And like, you know, I work in prison, and yeah. so that those, um, the way you see the schematics, you know, I, I'd love to use that in a room with diverse people yeah. which to work in prison you could only do that. Yeah. So where do we find, I know you mentioned the Transitions website, but do you have yeah. those actual tools, that, you know, the ones that we were showing earlier, on that side? Or is this a paper? Because it's, it's fascinating. It's, uh, some of it's a paper, some of it's on the site, um, some of it is in the videos embedded, and then the really practical application is what I'm hoping to do with OHI. But, but, if there are people out there like you that want to take some of this further, we will bend over backwards to try and work with you to create um, interventions and props that you can take in and test that stuff. Like social practice theory or, um, well, and Stuart, Stuart, a lot of the visioning stuff that Stuart is going to be doing um, we absolutely are going to make everything we've got available for us. So thank you. That yeah. was fascinating. Thank you.